I want you to meet Mrs. Mary Cooley, a midwife who lives in Albany, Georgia. The film is also a legend. This is the children and grandchildren of Flaherty's one-time film stars have lived with for more than four decades. And we worked for the people that worked in the mill, the, the mill villages. We and therefore we asked ourselves this question. What could happen if the people had the technology of communications in their own hands? George Stoney um, really is considered the father of public access TV. And uh, he died this year at the age of 96. And uh, we are lucky to have this wonderful panel of folks here uh, to tell us and their, about their relationship with George and uh, give us a taste of the vast array of work that he produced in his lifetime. Um, I want to thank uh, those people who helped to make this event possible, uh, the sponsors and supporters of the festival, uh, Scott Campitelli uh, at RETN, and you can see his staff and crew around. Uh, VCAM is a big sponsor of the festival. Uh, CCTV, the Center for Media and Democracy and Channel 17, uh, Town Meeting Television for the inspiration for this tribute and for uh, contributing so much towards helping us publicize the festival. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Orly Yadin here, our uh, executive director, who's done a fabulous job. Before I, I turn things over to uh, the, our, our moderator here, uh, Greg Epler Wood, uh, I just want to give you a little anecdote about my connection uh, with, with George. Uh, it was back uh, maybe six, five, six, seven years ago when my company, Documentary Educational Resources, I decided it would be a good idea to try to bring all of George Stoney's films under one roof to make them accessible as a distributor. We were a distributor. Um, I went down to New York to visit George to sign, have the contract signed, and uh, we, went, we went out to lunch, and George was probably n at least 90, maybe 91, 92 at the time, and uh, we're, we're sitting there at lunch, and uh, George starts looking at his watch. And I said, gee, George, you know, if you have to uh, go somewhere, you know, uh, wh 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 where do you need to be? He said, I've got to get back to NYU to teach my class. <laughs> and I almost fell off my chair. But I, I think that demonstrates the kind of guy George was right to the end. Uh, and uh, the kind of energy uh, and effort he put into his entire life. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to turn things over to uh, our moderator, uh, Greg Epler-Wood. Greg has been involved in public access television since 1979. Uh, when as a grad student, uh, he catalyzed Iowa uh, State University to launch the first use of its educational access channels and soon thereafter held board and committee positions in the NFLCP, now known as the Alliance for Community Media. That's where he met George and became a devotee. His career as a professional filmmaker of sponsored films and a, um, and a professor and administrator of film, video, and TV production at the American University began in 1973. But his spare time during those 20 years was uh, filled with volunteering to help others to express themselves in media. In 1993, he was able to fully engage in his first love, public access TV. Um, and uh, then he was hired to uh, run a startup and community media center in Bennington, Vermont. So he is a fellow Vermonter. Uh, since moving to Burlington in 2000 with his wife, Megan, Greg has been consulting to com uh, community media centers in Vermont and in the Northeast. So without further ado, Greg, thanks.
Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to uh, thank Jane Gutteridge of the National Film Board of Canada. She's up in Toronto for some of the video that she's provided for us today, too. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is George C. Stoney. My outlook on life has been shaped in good part by the obligations that I've assumed. Uh, I've got to finish a film. <laughs> I've got a major commitment to this person. I've got classes to attend. And my life has been shaped by the obligations. I was born uh, July the 1st, 1916 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My, my mother died when I was seven. And that, of course, changed uh, many things. My father uh, was a failed preacher who uh, made a precarious living uh, selling brushes and vacuum cleaners and that kind of thing and uh, had a couple of, uh, had five little rent rental houses which he rental rented to, to blacks. Uh, so he was, he was, he was poor. Poor but proud, I would say. It never occurred to me that I should make films until after the war, after the Second World War, when uh, <coughs> a, college student, a college friend, uh, Nick Reed, with whom I'd gotten to know in Chapel Hill, started a little uh, educational film unit in Athens, Georgia, started with the help of, of the Kellogg Foundation. So he hired me to write scripts, and before long I was going out and, and uh, directing. People ask me, how many films did you do, have you done? And I say, I don't know, because which are my films? They're always a collaboration. And I think it's often forgotten when we feature documentary filmmakers that documentary is bound to be a collaboration. And the first people you collaborate with are the people in front of the camera. George continues to teach at NYU. My greatest satisfaction comes from the young people I meet in, in my teaching. I'm trying to influence my students to not use their cameras to catch people out, but to make uh, people more interested in their communities. I think that education is a matter of, of uh, connecting, connecting people to people. George is not slowing down. I have classes. Uh, uh, assigned to me for the fall and, and spring of next year. And I have uh, a major documentary in the editing room right now. Why, in his 90s, does he continue to work so hard? Do I have a choice? Uh, you see, in my career, I have never made a film by myself. I've always had colleagues, and those colleagues depend on me and I depend on them. And I can't stop because I would let them down. The same thing's true of, of uh, teaching. People come into my classes, and I get to know them, and they get to know something about my connections. And two, three, five years later, they write me, they call me, they want to know. I can't quit because it would be a betrayal of, of their trust. I'd like to welcome everyone to the George Stoney Tribute. This is entitled The George Stoney Tribute, How Film Can Change Lives. How Film Can Change Lives. This is the message that we hope to leave you with today. George, who died just after his 96th birthday this past July, has left an incredible legacy of not only extraordinary documentary film, but also was someone who changed the way documentary was regarded, produced, and exhibited in the United States and Canada. We have assembled a panel of people who knew and have worked and taught with George to tell this story, a film career that spanned an amazing 65 years. 
On your far right, Larry Kirkman recently stepped down as the Dean of the American University School of Communication in Washington, D.C., where he is a film professor. And his familiarity of George extends back to the early 70s when he emulated George's pioneering use of the first portable consumer video at the LA Public Access Project. In addition to being a promoter and facilitator of community media centers, between then and now, he has been a writer, festival and conference organizer, and American Film Institute's first director of TV and video. He and his wife share their time between Washington, D.C. and Manchester, Vermont. Lauren Glenn Davidian is the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont, and is, in many people's opinion, including mine, the reason that our state has the most equitable system of public educational and governmental access centers in the United States. Only here in Vermont do you find these community media centers in even the most rural and sparsely populated towns and villages. After being introduced to George in 1985, she was inspired to found and craft CCTV to be the embodiment of his philosophy that individuals and social entities should be given the opportunity to tell their own stories for the betterment of society. And then finally in the center is David Bagnell. David is a filmmaker and graduate of the film school at NY New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and has collaborated in projects with George for over 15 years. David has worked as director, producer, editor, and director of photography on documentary films about many subjects. He currently teaches at NYU's Tisch School for the Arts of the Arts, Film, and Television Department and has become, in a sense, the collector and safekeeper of George's films, mementos, papers, and we trust his legacy of film ethics to pass on to future generations of media makers. One example of his work is George's filmography that some of you might have picked up on the way in, but we do have some copies available here as well. Okay, so we have a very packed two hours ahead of us and um, want to allow enough time at the end for open discussion with you in the audience. And uh, we hope you will stay for a screening of, a full screening of one of George's uh, collaborative films, The Uprising of, nine, of 34. Um, we have to announce right now that unfortunately, uh, Judith Helfand, uh, who is one of the principal directors with George, uh, will not be able to make it. You see, she's editing on a, on, a, on a tight deadline and was just unable to make it here, unfortunately. However, we have a couple of folks in the panel who will be showing part, uh, clips of the, of the uprising here today and talking about it for in her behalf. Um, so let's start right in with the earliest remembrances of George. Uh, we're so happy uh, to have us uh, here today with us, a, a contemporary of George's here in the audience, someone whose family knew and had social occasions with him in his uh, pre-film days as a working journalist back in the 1940s. Uh, she frequently talked with George while he was making his early films, and you're going to hear from her on a video in a moment. Her name is Cecile Starr, a writer, critic, reviewer, columnist, and editor, and historian of film and filmmakers beginning in the 1940s, with her work appearing over the next few decades in the Saturday Review, New York Times, and Sightlines, just to name three of many. She taught film history and criticism at Columbia University from 1955 to 1961. She claimed she was uh, competing for students with NYU at the time. Mm -hmm. And her knowledge of the world's first woman film director, Alice Guy Blaché, is quite renowned. Fortunately, she lives here in Burlington with her husband, Aaron Boyajan, and she was able to attend today in person. So, Cecile, would you mind showing folks who you are? Raise your hand, wave a little bit. <laughs> so our next video clip of uh, Cecile, as a matter of fact, uh, needs a little bit of a setup. An early film that George was involved with, one that's not even on the uh, filmography of 101 films, if you can believe it, is entitled Feeling All Right. It was produced to encourage African Americans in Mississippi to seek the new penicillin treatment for syphilis. So let's roll that right now and let Cecile tell us what happened. When they first started showing Feeling All Right in theaters to especially invited and public audiences, they advertised that it was going to be preceded by a short with Lena Horne. And after a while, they dropped the Lena Horne short because people were coming to see the health film. The word spread so well, and so many people went for the testing, and there was so much sense of this is the right way to reach people, not just through putting a sign up in the barbershop or whatever they would have done before. 
I didn't know George as a journalist, but my uncles knew him and friends, common mutual friends between George and my two uncles in Nashville. One of the friends, that, a lifelong friend of George's, was a man who was named Lon Cheney. That wasn't his, that was just a nickname, but I don't know what his real name was. And he was a newspaper journalist uh, covering political material, but he also at one point wrote speeches for the governor of Tennessee. And that would be the level that George was palling around with. It wasn't just covering a stabbing on the corner uh, at midnight. It was, he was already finding out how do you get things done? How do you get to the people who are gonna listen? How, who knows who? And uh, I think that this was before he really even started in film. He was already ready to say, things are gonna change here. We're talking about the solid South and solid segregation. And these few efforts that they made in the film world to set a mark and say, we have people here who have the same problems you have and we'd better talk about them and we'd better do something about them. This was in George's rather quiet and withdrawn way, he was never Pussy. He was never offensive about it. He was never. He never attacked people. He just said, "We could do this. Why don't we do it?" And that was the, as I understand it, that was the way he went into film. He simply saw this produces results. And you can imagine George Stoney, not only a journalist but a Southern journalist, a bit able to tell stories in such a way that even to today, we understand how that happens in novelists and filmmakers, film screenwriters, and so on. Well, Cecile was in close communication with George during the filming of another film directed to the Southern black communities, All My Babies, A Midwife's Own Story, a movie that Cecile later would join a panel of judges to award a special prize at the 1952 Robert Flaherty Film Festival. So let's see that. Yes, I knew him. Well, during the filming of All My Babies, I'm not certain now. I did write frequently in my column in the Saturday Review. I did a little review like this and said, too bad it's not available to the public, but someday things will change and it will be, something like that. Um, but then I mentioned the film whenever I could mainly because it stood out in my mind uh, so much and the uh, way that filmmakers in New York reacted. That was, that was George's calling card. That allowed him from move, to move from being a Southern filmmaker to being a, a big time documentary filmmaker. When he started making that film, he thought he had written the script, he thought he was in charge, and he thought he knew that it was going to be a film like the other films, Palmer Street, which was about mental health problems for black people, feeling all right. He thought that All My Babies was going to be about having a healthy birthing with a midwife. And it didn't take him long to find out that he was not in charge, that the woman who he had begged to be in the film, she was so far superior to everyone else he saw, that she was going to be in charge and he was going to do exactly what she said. And this was the perfect collaboration that made this film a super film and not just another good or very good film. And he told me in the middle of when he was shooting that uh, he had learned one thing, that when you discover that you're in the middle of a film which is so much bigger than you are, you have to give it everything you've got. He'd used up all the money he could get from the state of Georgia He'd gone over his time, uh, agreed on time schedule. He'd 
but he kept going. He wouldn't stop until he got what he thought was everything you could get out of that film. And of course, that's what makes not just a great film, but a one of a kind, one in a million films. And that was George's calling card and his chief pride for the rest of his life, in my opinion. And you're going to hear about that million dollar, more about that million dollar movie and see clips from it, uh, All My Babies, uh, with David Bagnall. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, wow, well, Cecile put it so well and is able to speak as a contemporary. Are the mics on? Are the mics on? I'll lean a bit closer. How's that? That's good. All right. So um, I just want to give you a little uh, further back history to George. Uh, as he said, uh, born in 1916 in Winston-Salem, and he went to the uh, University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill in, what did we say, 35 sure. to 37? Uh, 30, 33. 33 to 37, 37 years, right. Yeah. And um, with the full intention of becoming a journalist, studying journalism. This is where his activist nature really blossomed. Uh, his teachers there, he loved his teachers there. He had great things to say about them in, in many letters I've read uh, from that time frame. And uh, came out of school looking for a job, not sure how he was going to get a job. Did a lot of hitchhiking around the South, seeing America, uh, changing his views of what his father had taught him about America, what his teachers in college had taught him about America, and finding it out for himself and wrote uh, for the Survey Graphic and um, for a couple other newspapers just on a freelance position, mainly about suffrage in the South, race relations in the South, and unions. So you can see his, his interests were there at the very beginning, but I think he was just a little unsure about how to implement them. So he didn't really get involved into film until uh, after the war. Um, in the late 30s and early 40s, he worked for the Farm Security Administration, uh, producing a Farmers on the Air program for radio and also showing Per Lorenz's The River film um, to tenant farmers, uh, also you know, extolling the virtues of the New Deal and advertising for Roosevelt and all of that. Um, but it was there, it was in those screenings of the river that he started to see the power of film. He would have discussions afterwards and, um, you know, really began to see that this is a medium that can have some change in people's lives. And then he went to the war, uh, served in the Air Force in England, uh, mostly on photo reconnaissance. And when he came back from the war, his old uh, college colleague Nick Reed hired him at the Southern Educational Film Production Service and there he did a number of different films, um, educational films about birth, about syphilis, about just you know public health issues and mainly as a writer. Uh, eventually writing to his sister uh, Libba in 1946, uh, 47 it was, uh, he said, I had my first crack at directing. If telling a cow which way to look can be called that. <laughs> so that was really his, his, first, his first time at, at directing. It was directing a short scene. Uh, from then, uh, you know, he continued to write, directing more scenes, getting a little bit more of the directorial status at the Southern Educational Film Production Service, and then getting the job to direct his first film, which was Palmer Street. Uh, as Cecile said, a film about mental health. Um, but more than that, it really was uh, speaking directly to the community, speaking directly to the parents of children that had mental health issues and what they could do about it. Uh, that film was made uh, under the sponsorship of the Georgia Public Health Department, which loved the film. The film did very well, won several awards. Uh, he then went back up to Washington, did a film about uh, births in hospitals which gave him a bit of uh, stature to come back to the Georgia Department of Health to pitch All My Babies. Now, All My Babies was a film that 
he had wanted to make since he was a paper boy in Winston-Salem. Uh, he would walk around on his paper route and he'd see early in the morning, uh, as he began work, he'd see these, these black women in their long black coats walking with their doctors, black leather bags, uh, in and out of people's homes. And they were mysterious and fascinating. And he started to talk to them and, and ask them about their profession. And was just enamored with the whole idea of the midwife. And he had toyed with the idea, since he was a writer, he had toyed with the idea of writing a novel about it. Uh, then he toyed with the idea, after he started to get into film, uh, about writing a feature film, a fiction film about it. And he tried to shop that around, having no success. Found that the only people that were interested in a film about midwives, makes sense, were public health departments. And since he had already established a relationship with the Georgia Department of Health, they went for it and collaborated on Making All My Babies in 1952. Um, for the better part of uh, the end of 1951, he traveled around the South with a black doctor named William Mason, who introduces uh, the clip, introduces the film uh, with narration. And they went around with, uh, upon the advice of some clinic doctors, local clinic doctors uh, in Georgia, trying to find their midwife that would make this film speak to other midwives. This was going to be a training film for other black southern midwives. Wasn't really in their original vision to have doctors use it. Wasn't really in their original vision at all to have anybody in the film community bothered to see this film. This was strictly a training film for black southern midwives. So we had two nurse consultants on the film, uh, Miss Cadwallader, and I'm blanking on the other person's name right now. Um, but they gave him 118 teaching points that he had to have in this film. And uh, he poured over that a lot, wrote several versions of a script, uh, as Cecile talks about, uh, thought he was in charge. And then he finally found his midwife in Miss Mary Frances Hill Coley and began to understand that he needed to listen to her more and have her influence on the script. Uh, and, and she really did. She really changed the script through morning meetings at her house. Uh, George and Dr. Mason and Mary Coley would sit down around the breakfast table and, and talk about the script itself, what she would say, what she wouldn't say, how she would handle herself. And this is really the first time that uh, I envisioned George speaking his very famous words that many of you may know, that the first people that you collaborate with on a film are the people in front of the camera. Miss Mary is going to be on the screen here talking to other midwives. How would she do it? I can't just write the script. Let me see what she would say. And he went around uh, with her on several, several uh, patient visits, finally witnessing his first birth, um, and was just amazed by her mannerisms, uh, the way that she dealt with her patients, um, the way that she patiently talked to them, and the way that she got down to business very professionally when the time came. So the clips you're going to see, uh, again, the intro with a narration by Dr. William Mason really kind of sums up the idea of the film. Um, then you're going to see Miss Mary uh, have her first uh, beginning of her clinic visit uh, with one of her patients, Ida. And then you're going to go into a little segment uh, with uh, Maybell, who was kind of the bad mother in the film. She was very poor. Ida's birth went very well, um, went without a hitch. It's kind of the, this is how things should happen. And then Maybell's sequence is much more, this is how things can go. And from what Miss Mary told George, how they quite often did go. Uh, when you aren't prepared, when you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of support, uh, you're further out in the rural areas of Albany, Georgia, and uh, complications happen. Uh, from there, we go to uh, the actual birth scene. And since I'm not going to get a chance to talk about it before it happens, I just want to prepare you. This is a training film for black midwives. 
doctors, nurses eventually saw this film. It's a medical film. There is an actual birth in this film, and it's uh, graphic. So prepare yourself for that. Um, but one interesting thing to look at as you watch, especially the birth sequence, is that it is uh, almost completely in silence. He didn't have, he only had sound for two weeks of the production, uh, sync sound. Other than that, it was all laid in narration afterwards or trying to sync up dialogue that was shot earlier and uh, voice recorded later. Um, and then uh, the, this section ends, uh, the whole clips of All My Babies end with this wonderful song that is based on a uh, African-American spiritual which George wrote the lyrics for. And I think that's just a wonderful thing. George was a wonderful writer. Um, you know, I can't speak enough, uh, now that I've read a lot of his, his early writings, uh, both in his letters and his published works, he is a masterful writer. And uh, I was surprised, you know, 10 years ago when I heard that George wrote the lyrics. Now that I know more of his writing skill, I am not surprised at, at, at how beautiful that turned out. So let's watch the clips from All My Babies, 1952. I want you to meet Mrs. Mary Cooley, a midwife who lives in Albany, Georgia. This is a story of how she helps people, people like Ida Fleming, who engaged Miss Mary to deliver her third child. People like Adam and Maribel Dudley, newcomers to Doherty County, who bring their troubles to this midwife. In the county health department are doctors and nurses who help Miss Mary do the job to which she and thousands of other midwives all over the South have dedicated their lives, the birthing of healthy babies. I'm gonna hug you close to my heart now, ain't that good news? All these your babies, Miss Mary? Yes, these are all my babies. Delivered about 1,400. Kind of ones come this year. Here's my two. I'm gonna send you a real little baby picture, this next one, Miss Mary. Well, you do that thing, honey. Oh, that Ida. Ain't nothing bothering her now. But I remember four years ago, she was so scared, I had to take her to the clinic myself. Now, I just didn't know how many bills were living out there, 11 miles down that hard up road. Like Maybell done forgot what Miss Penny told her to eat. But you know it's hard to eat when you ain't hungry and by yourself all day long. I wish to goodness all my mothers could have everything fixed up this nice. I'll have to move the bed over to get down to that light. Baby tray fixed. Gonna move that table down this way to lay out my things on. Mm, even got the slop jar fixed on the paper. Oh, look at them pretty new shoes. Look like Tom done bought somebody a present. Let's see how you doing, Adam. You are fine.
But pretty soon, I want you to start pushing down and pant like a dog. <laughs> Remember now, that's to keep the baby's head from coming down too fast. What you want this time, Ida? Little girl or boy? It don't make no difference to me. We got us another healthy little old boy. <coughs> Come on, boy, let's get some of that old stuff out you where you can really raise a racket. Healthiest little old baby you ever saw. Yes, you is. Yes, you is. It's a beautiful film. Um, let me tell you just one uh, more anecdote uh, from the production of that film. George told me a few years ago, um, the first time they went out on a shoot, they had the whole crew together. This was an all northern crew. Uh, Peasley Bond was the director of photography. Um, Bob Galbraith, uh, assistant cameraman. Um, Bob Downey was the uh, lighting guy and electrical engineer. And they went out with Miss Mary. She had said, I've got a birth happening uh, this morning. Do you want to come with me? And they said, OK, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's get out there and do it. And they start setting up, and they're taking forever. And Miss Mary keeps coming back to George and saying, uh, you guys going to be ready soon? You're just about to have a baby. Baby's going to come sooner than you think. And George said, yeah, OK, no, we got you know, to set this up. And we're, we're worried about whether or not we have to uh, put a blue filter on some of the linens because they might come out too bright. And you know, they're shooting with, they're shooting with 35 millimeter cameras, which are you know, five times the size of, of what we're being filmed with today. And they're, they're large, and they can only be on tripods. So there's a lot of setup. And there's slow film stock, so there's a lot of lights that they have to bring in through the windows and all of that. And they're repositioning, and they're redoing, and they're doing all of this. And Five or six times, Miss Mary must have came up to George saying, I think we're going to have a baby sooner than you think. <laughs> Gets to be about lunchtime, and they're all breaking for lunch, and <laughs> crew is starting to leave. And Miss Mary says, you're not leaving, are you? And George says, well, I've got a union crew. I've got to give them a certain amount of time for lunch. And Miss Mary says, ah, George, we've got to have a baby sooner than you think. <laughs> sure enough, he had to call them back in from lunch because the baby started to come. and. 
The only footage that ended up getting used in the film, because that's really all they caught, was at the very beginning in the intro there, when a different mother is putting her arm around her baby that's coming back to her. That's all they managed to shoot on that one day. So, but they learned a lot that first day. Um, so All My Babies was an extraordinarily successful film. A beautiful uh, portrait of, of midwifery. Um, and a beautiful portrait of Miss Mary and the South at that time, much more than a training film. And uh, UNESCO picked it up and showed it around the world. Uh, I remember George telling a story of hearing from doctors in India who had seen the film. And George said, well, I, I, don't, I didn't realize it, was, it had been subtitled. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I can get you a subtitle copy. And the doctor said, it does not need to be subtitled. We all know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> And you've got it right, and, and you did a wonderful job. Um, and, and I think George was probably most proud of this film. Um, you know, so one of the measures of success uh, of the film in raising the status of midwives in both the African American and the white community was that a better quality of doctor started to volunteer to work at the clinics. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I think the point you just made, that uh, the film was shown around the world to doctors and nurses to get them to uh, understand the value of midwives. Mm -hmm. So it was a film made for midwives, but it had this worldwide impact on the whole medical profession. Right, yeah, thank you very much so, very much so. So, uh, so after All My Babies in 1952, George went on to do a whole series of uh, medical films, uh, other sponsored films, The American Road for the Ford Motor Company, uh, films for the Board and Milk Company. You know, you made your money how you could make your money. And George had to put a second mortgage on his house to finish All My Babies. So he had a lot of money to pay back. Uh, so he worked very hard uh, throughout the 50s and the 60s. And in 1967, I believe it was, uh, he was offered to take over um, for Henry Brightrose at Stanford University to teach for a semester. And that's where he met Bonnie Klein and Michael Rubo, uh, who were students of his, who then went on to work at the National Film Board of Canada. And in 1968, Lauren Glenn will tell you what happens next. So um, I just would like to thank everyone for being here. It's a pleasure, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel. I have my own mythology about George Stoney that I've carried since 1982, and it's interesting to fill in some of the details and understand better uh, some of the facts that I might have mythologized. So um, I would start by saying that George's uh, path to creating uh, a media a media culture that was very inclusive is, was a journey for him. And, and there is probably no one factor um, that led to him believing that people really should tell their own stories. But I think there were many factors. And I came to that in the same way. And um, when I was about 19 years old, I somehow got my hand on a book of essays by John Grierson, who was the founder of the British Film Board and then later the Canadian Film Board. And he had an essay in there um, that was called Spotlight on Democracy, where he talks about the value of film and documentary as propaganda to promote democracy. It was a, a specific counterattack against film that was used by the Nazis to promote fascism. And he had a very well-reasoned and thought through uh, analysis of how film could be used as a pro-democracy tool. And he had a, 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 a quote in there that has always stayed with me, and, and it goes, when good ideas spread like wildfire across the democratic sky, we're halfway towards living in a community worth living in. We're halfway towards a community worth living in. And when I read John Grierson, I, I, I was startled because I thought, somebody has written down what I think. And I didn't even really know that I thought these things until I had seen them echoed on these pages. And I was prompted to learn about Grierson. And long story short, he went from the British Film Board, where he had been hired to unite a community that was really uh, split along class lines. And then he was hired to, which was Great Britain at the time of the war, the Second War, Great War. 
And then he was hired by Canada to unite a country that was 3,000 miles long and 100 miles deep and very, very diverse. And the idea behind the Canadian Film Board was to unify this group of people into a sense of nationhood. And it was Grierson who first oversaw the films that were told about all different kinds of people in Canada. And then people were given film canisters and projectors and sent to church basements all across Canada where people and community were able to see pictures of themselves for the first time. And that idea of distributing in small settings was one I think that George had fallen even out of favor by the time George got to the film board, but George really <coughs> believed in very strongly. And there was, it, as a result of these stories that were told by filmmakers about communities, there was a backlash in the com Canadian film board, which long story short, led to the founding of Challenge for Change, which was a, a, a way of people in their own communities telling their own story. And George has, a, has a, a quote where he says, people should do their own filming, or at least see that they should control the content. I've spent much of my life making films about doctors or teachers or preachers that these people ought to have made themselves. And really that was the spirit of Challenge for Change project, which after it had been underway for a year, maybe more, um, George was asked to run in 1968. Now part of the mythology is that I thought George had made all those movies in the Challenge for Change, when in fact he was just the executive, not just, but he was the executive producer of so many of these films that are, are if you have the opportunity to see them, which I would encourage you to do, you can go to the Canadian Film Board site and see them. Um, real classics such as VTR Saint Jacques that we'll see in a moment, and uh, we are, you are on Indian land, which was about a face-off between the Mohawks at Asquan, I can't say it quite right. How do I say that? It's, uh, uh, thank you. Um, on the border between, between um, Quebec and New York, right? That's right. I think that's where, where it is. In any event, it was a standoff and it was one of the um, early standoffs because the Indians were being charged duty on groceries that they were bringing across the border. And so this was one of the great films that was made by the Challenge for Change team. The, the VTR Saint Jacques film that we're about to see was very influential on, on our thinking in Vermont and the start of public access television because in VTR Saint Jacques, um, for the first time, the film board had bought some portable video equipment with the idea of um, giving it to producers to go and record the story of this neighborhood in Montreal. And the two producers, um, Bonnie Klein and Dorothy okay. Hino, um, were said to George, we're going to take this portable video and we're going into this inner city neighborhood and we want you to make a film about what we're doing. And we want you to document what we're doing. And George wasn't so sure about portable video at the time. This was kind of a new concept for him. And so the idea was the folks took these cameras, as you'll see, and they used it as one tool in the toolkit of community change. And we start by seeing the, the idea behind Vitier Saint Jacques. So why don't we watch this first segment? And then we'll go and see what happened once people started recording what folks in the neighborhood really wanted to change for themselves. In the Saint-Jacques district in Montreal, people live out their days without the power to change the conditions of their lives. To obtain a voice in their own affairs, several people from the district got together with the help of a community organizer. They formed the Saint-Jacques Citizens Committee, in which workers and unemployed, students, housewives, and welfare recipients now participate. Their first action, after petitioning in vain to the authorities for better health care, was to establish their own medical clinic administered by the Citizens Committee. 
to inform the people in Saint-Jacques about their clinic and to involve them in the future of the committee. The citizens felt the need for better communication. But the established media are not accessible to ordinary people, especially the poor. We, therefore, asked ourselves this question. What could happen if the people had the technology of communications in their own hands? Oui. Il y a une petite lumière rouge qui commence à l'intérieur et tu vois que tu es en train de filmer. Mais c'est peut-être pas encore chauffé, ça prend une minute pour ah chauffer. Oui, j'ai vu des lumières. Alors ici, c'est la lumière, c'est tout à fait noir, là. C'est à deux que c'est le plus clair. Puis on a rarement des circonstances ah où, oui. où il fait assez vois. clair pour être obligé de l'ajuster. Why did we use the VTR? Because the Citizens Committee, the reason it exists, is to really represent the people of this neighborhood. I started out with the idea to get the people to talk. Il y a des batteries à l'intérieur et puis euh, euh, le froid euh, empêche les batteries de donner leur, leur pied rendement. Puis à ce moment-là, euh, le travail n'est pas aussi bon. Vous dites que vous venez au bien social pour des verres? Pour des verres. Est-ce que le bien social a fourni quelque chose pour les verres? Bien, rendu à mon âge, j'ai eu une pension des vieux. Ah, vous avez la pension des vieux? Des vieux. 68 ans. 68 ans, en fait. Et puis, euh, est-ce que vous pensez avoir la difficulté à se poser du bien je, social? Je ne le sais pas. Vous ne savez pas? Non. Vous avez espoir tout de même qu'on fasse quelque chose? Parce qu'avec l'argent que vous savez, euh, ce n'est pas suffisant pour euh, être capable... Ce n'est pas suffisant. Non? Non. Payer le loyer, puis le chauffeur, puis l'électricité, puis tout. On n'est pas, pas quand même d'arriver. Well, maybe people aren't afraid to talk because they see who's holding the camera. That it's people like themselves. To me, this film is like the Axis Mundi of citizen-controlled media. And today, when we think about how much power we have in our pockets, we have virtual television studios in our pockets, and there's thousands and millions of hours on YouTube and media just flying across the democratic sky like wildfire, but really how much of it is being used for social change? how much of it is being used to help people improve their lives. And so VTR Saint-Jacques is a film that really is the, um, it, a, founding, a founding story of our movement in public access, and I can't help but think that it had, and I, it's been written about, uh, just an enormous impact on George's thinking about what could happen when people take media into their own hands and use it as a way of creating conversation and dialogue between themselves. So understanding very quickly the power that they had in, in, in this neighborhood in Montreal, the people got together and they said, we are going to go across the neighborhood and we're going to ask everybody what they think we need to do and what needs to be done differently. And, and this next section is, is called, I think, Operation Snowball, and they really take this on as an organizing effort. So let's see what happens next. Ces caméras là, est-ce que c'est pour passer à la télévision? Peut-être ça va passer à la télévision, mais là, euh, on peut pas dire si ça va passer à la télévision. Peut-être que ça va passer euh, dans des salles de cinéma ou. Je sais pas, dans des salles paroissiales, qu'on va montrer ça aux gens. Merci. Pourquoi vous ne mettez pas de ça dans, dans, dans la télévision? Vous ne pas? Ah, bien, Radio-Canada, vous savez, euh, c'est pas nous autres qui gouvernent. Our VTR is only for closed circuit projection. What we need is wider broadcast. The Citizens Committee plans Operation Boule de Neige, or Snowball a week-long information and recruiting campaign in Saint-Jacques. By editing the VTR interviews, they construct a program to show on closed-circuit television 
at a series of five public meetings. We don't try to appear objective like the, the interviewers on television. What David said before that George had to mortgage his second house to finish that film, um, you realize what a revolution again that portable cameras were. And there's a really wonderful scene in this film that I really urge you to see, we're not showing it, where the mainstream media comes and um, really challenges <laughs> this citizens committee about how they think that they could tell the story of this community and how dare you. And the media guys, the mainstream media people, get really mad at the, at the people who would presume to take this equipment and tell the story of the people. So what happens is they, they call everyone together and they say, all right, come on Wednesday night. We've made, we've made put together this, your stories and come and see what you said. And folks come together, as we'll see, and they, um, the power of people being in the same room and watching film together about themselves has a galvanizing effect that, again, it isn't simply the making of the stories and the sharing of the stories. It's the impact that when people see that they have common cause with each other, that's where the spark of organizing and change can actually happen. It, it's, I, I think that we, um, again, we see the power of distributed activism on the internet, and that has a, a, a unique and important power, a global power. But I think that it's, it's vital for us to remember that when we actually get together in person and the electricity that runs through us runs through each of us together, it creates a spark that really can make, um, make change happen based on personal relationships and, as I said before, common cause. So George took this concept, which we see here so beautifully laid out, and we'll see it in its conclusion in the last segment, and he, he realizes the power of this tool in the toolkit for social change. And he becomes not just a person who shares other people's stories, but he becomes an evangelist for this kind of work. And he goes to an educational center. He goes to New York University, and he starts to teach. And he teaches the first generation, and the second generation, and the third generation of video activists. And that became the basis of the first brigades of public access television, because not only did he and Red Burns realize that we needed to train people to teach, but that we had to change the regulatory structure of the country to open these channels so that you weren't relying simply on closed circuit, but that you were busting open the media, the mainstream media domination. And they did that by challenging FCC rules, and they did that by ultimately having a role to play in the Cable Communications Act of 1984, which allowed for these public access channels to start all over the country. So this, again, I think this piece and the, his work at Challenge for Change, which was building um, all the previous work that George had, uh, motivated him. The electricity ran through him, and he really was able to articulate that film had the potential not only for people to see themselves, but gave them the power to change their circumstance. And God knows we need more of that. So let's see how it wraps up at VTR Saint-Jacques. Yeah, I'm
We really don't know where all this will lead. You try different ways to bring people together. The people identify with the people on the screen. They feel at home. Ça, ça appartient à quelques gros propriétaires qui vous louent des, des, des taudis, des, des, des vieilles cabanes qui, qui sont même pas vivables. Ils mettent. Oh, c'est pas, pas normal. Du tout. Les murs tout fendus, tout recraqués. Il faut faire le ménage, puis ça nous coûte des 200 pièces de peinture, puis de tapisserie, puis il euh, y a des rats, il y a des coquerelles, il y a des souris, il y a tout ce que vous voulez là-dedans. Si le gouvernement était, était basé en fonction de l'ouvrier, en fonction de la classe ouvrière, qui n'était pas basé en fonction de, de, des profits d'une certaine classe exploitante à ce moment-là. Alors, il y a peut-être un problème qui se pose, c'est le problème de ce qu'on appelle les gros bonnets. Je pense que j'ai saisi assez bien sur ton idée, c'est que... Alors, que penser de ces gens-là? C'est-à-dire que eux se promènent en limousine, puis ils mangent du poulet, alors que nous... Si vous crevez de faim, ils n'ont jamais manqué de manger dans le maison. Vous pouvez bien vous faire du... le petit crève de faim. Vous pouvez bien le faire, ça, eux autres. Ça ne fait rien, non plus. Le, 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 le frigidaire, eux autres, du manger. Si vous êtes intéressé, à tous les mercredis, on a des réunions où on discute de nos problèmes. Comment ça marche pour bien I think it's all very well to have the VTR, but it's only a machine. Right. The committee has different methods. The VTR is just one of them. It's a very expensive tool. It takes time and money. Mais si on pouvait organiser un système de garderie pour ça, ça garder les patent, enfants... Ça serait pas tant, ça serait pas tant. Ah, garantie. Ah, garantie. <rire> on va, euh, on, dit, on va faire de la publicité. Oui? Ah oui, ouais. on vous annonce ça. Merci, qui est-ce que vous voulez? Donc, la prochaine section, vous allez voir George uh, en fait parler du Challenge for Change himself. Il va vous dire l'histoire un peu. The next three clips are from a uh, 2009 interview with him by Kat Chizek, a filmmaker in residence, created within a reinvigorated Challenge for Change program. Since 2006, Kat and other filmmakers, so heavily influenced by George's time there, have been focusing on urban health issues, mirroring George's earliest work with Southern Blacks. You see how low tech I am. Do you still have film? You got film in that camera? Yes. Film. Fifty miles north of here. Wow. Yeah. What do you think of uh, the NFB reinventing Challenge for Change? Well, I think it's about time. <laughs> I don't think they should have uh, given it up when they did. What, what is Challenge for Change? Well, Challenge for Change is <clears throat> an approach to media which assumes that social change is the objective. Now, the film board started with this idea. Grissom knew that he, he that the film board had a purpose to make Canadians united for the war. But to do that, he didn't just make the films. He had, um, he had distributors out in the field with organizing public meetings where the films were shown and then people would talk about that afterwards. people going out in the, the, to the rural circuits. I went with one of the, with Vaughn Deacon, um, a rural circuit rider uh, in 1947. 
David about the war. He had uh, people uh, working with labor unions. He had people going to church basements. Always there were public meetings where the showing of the film was only a part of the evening. The film board got away from that. Uh, they got a few things in the theaters and they starry-eyed, ah, we're going to be, that's going to be our future. Then television came, uh, came along and they got some of them on nighttime television and ah, that was great. And when I arrived at, in Canada, the challenge for change had been well started before I got there. Uh, <clears throat> this seemed to be an approach that was quite different. And I think one of the reasons I was brought in was that I had made a number of films in the States for government agencies to increase their the ability to work with people. <laughs> George came in with a uh, two-year contract and he uh, left to do other things in 1970. <laughs> But when he arrived, or before, I should say, before George was hired to take over the Challenge for Change program, all was not completely well. He intimated some of this problems, these problems. Uh, there was an incident related to a film produced two years before George arrived entitled Things I Cannot Change. It's somewhat ironic that the word change was in the title of that film because, as you'll see in the next clip, George was the perfect filmmaker at the perfect time to change the Challenge for Change program itself by leading it to a whole new philosophy of documentary filmmaking. So let's see the next piece. Some documentary filmmakers mm -hmm. secretly believe, or not so secretly believe, mm -hmm. that ethics get in the way of documentary filmmaking in the sensational and, and in the reality mm -hmm. TV approach. Um, and even in, in some, mm -hmm. some more, uh, you know, so-called uh, independent documentary work. And, and that brings me back to that letter, letter of apology that you wrote. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in hearing how that came to be. Well, <clears throat> things I cannot change, if one sees it out of context, is a beautiful film. We're going to bring a little tiny baby home. Yeah, a little baby we're going to bring home. Just a little one. Yeah. Its no, purpose no. was to illustrate the struggle of a poor family with all of these problems. It's an hour-long film. The family saw some of the footage before the, it was cut. Uh, I don't know how much there was, they saw. The next time they saw the film was when the neighbors called saying, you are on television. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here and get off that window. Come on. The two of you. Call the police. Call the police. Well, they were so demeaned by the contempt of the people around that they had to move out of the, the neighborhood. And I said, that will never happen again. What we should have done, and I've done this many times in my own films, is that <clears throat> while we're making the film, we're educating the people we're working with to the purposes of the film, so that very often they are the chief advocates for the film, live advocates when the film is out. Uh, that family was not helped in that way. George influenced the way filmmakers approached their art and craft at a time when production equipment was getting smaller, lighter, and cheaper, particularly with its shift to video, as you saw in the earlier VTR Saint-Jacques. And this made his method of incorporating the subjects of his film into the filmmaking process itself much easier. But the question is now, today, and it was in the time that this interview was done, whether or not the new paradigm shift brought on by the internet and all its accessible media applications is challenging some of George's basic production and distribution tenets. Let's roll the next clip. You know, the whole idea of media is to mediate. And ironically, a lot of media does exactly the opposite. When you were starting at Challenge for Change, it was the shift from film 
to video. And in many respects, this new wave of Challenge for Change comes at a time when there's a shift from film and video and linear documentary over to this digital internet, less linear, non-linear capacity that that technology affords us. And I'm wondering, I was wondering if you had some comments about that or advice, you know, is, are we, is it basically the same issue? Or does the technology define, does the media define the, the message? Well, I think if you will play uh, BTR Saint-Jacques, which is a film about the challenge for change, first use of video. Look at the last, and listen to the last scene. It helps us make contact with people we wouldn't otherwise reach. Yes, but what's important is to follow it up, to work face to face with the people. And I'm paraphrasing, it's just a machine. The next step is to, we should do something about it. And over and over, I find that if you just concentrate on the media, the people I you forget with the why you did it. I think that in some ways, the attention played to, to documentary by festivals is counterproductive. Right. And linking up production with yes. distribution. That yes. it's not just about being right. in the film, it's also about about being in that in that church basement, mm -hmm. wherever that church basement may be today. And I would argue that that church basement can happen online, like through web stuff as well. I'm not so sure, because when people see a material in isolation, I'm not sure that it has anything like the effect. Give me 10 people in a room who come together purposefully to see the will and then do something about it. And I'll swap that for 10,000 people who are just kind of surfing and happened to find my sea and saw it. And we had a hit. We enter a new phase of George's career, or a different phase, I should say, with the discussion with uh, Larry Kirkman. So, Larry? Thank you, Greg. Um, so here, George is at NYU in the 70s, and uh, he's navigating many different strands of filmmaking, uh, bringing uh, traditions uh, that he's been part of uh, for more than 20 years, together with uh, his students who have been influenced by Verite, Fly on the Wall, observation of filmmaking of the 60s, and of course, uh, his uh, new pioneering leadership role in the use of video. Uh, I remember uh, interviewing George at this time and, and writing an article uh, about uh, his uh, work uh, making videos in the community in New York to expose landlords uh, who were refusing to make repairs in low-income apartment buildings. And uh, he worked with the tenants uh, to record the evidence of housing violations. And then uh, they went together to uh, government hearings and played them back, the shots back, one by one. It was difficult in those days, early on in video, to edit. It was cumbersome. So he didn't bother editing. He just found the important scenes, the testimony of the tenants, the evidence of the violations, and showed this, those in the hearings to great impact. It was a revelation for me. And I said, here's a great filmmaker. He's not even editing. <laughs> you know, he's going down, and it was all about the impact and the community building and using video as a tool for social change. Uh, at the same time, uh, he was uh, tied to the tradition of, uh, of uh, filmmaking that we saw in All My Babies. Uh, the dramatic filmmaking uh, that was mission-driven documentaries that used casting, stagings, reenactments, uh, scripted narration, music. Uh, these techniques uh, were very close to him. They were, they were rooted in his film culture. Uh, in 1934, 
Uh, he saw Robert Flaherty's The Man of Aaron in a movie theater when he was in college. Uh, and we saw that in the uh, Farm Services Administration, he used Per Lorenz's great films that used these same techniques. Uh, Flaherty invented the feature documentary that used an emotional storyline. And uh, George uh, found that inspiring. It made a great impression on him. Uh, another strand I wanted to mention in his history is that when he was doing his reporting in the South, uh, uh, covering the poll tax, uh, poor tenant farmers, uh, he traveled with Lewis Hine, the great photographer. So uh, he had an early appreciation for the power of, of, the, of, the, of the image. And, um, and then he was a field assistant for Gunnar Myrdal uh, on his great report on uh, uh, African Americans and democracy. Uh, and he developed the technique, uh, techniques for uh, gaining rapport with his subjects. You know, as a summary, I think, in my own mind, that most filmmakers make films about their subjects. Uh, George started by making films for people, and he discovered the power of making films with them. In fact, the words he used in the 50s were that he realized that they should be making the films themselves, and at least he should make the films through them. So with or through. And then what we see uh, with the rise of video, uh, that he takes on a role as advocate and enabler, creating platforms for people to make their own media. Uh, so as I said, he, he brings this uh, tradition of dramatic filmmaking to NYU at the same time that he's inventing the new tradition of, uh, of, of public access. And then he runs up against students who are uh, uh, committed to uh, filmmaking that doesn't use any of the techniques that he thinks are most powerful. Uh, they've rejected uh, the casting, the staging, the reenactments. Uh, so he decided to make a movie that would study Robert Flaherty's Man of Aaron. So it's called How the Myth Was Made. Uh, uh, and the study is really uh, takes on the themes that have emerged in our discussion today. Uh, what is the responsibility of the filmmaker? Uh, what's the role of the subjects in making the film? Uh, uh, how uh, is the film distributed and what impact and use does it have? And what are the methods for representing uh, the reality uh, that the film's about? Uh, the, the real, uh, uh, I think, understanding that George brought to the limits of verite uh, are expressed in this quote from him where he said, the style gave the aura of truth to whatever was photographed. Now the camera shook and went out of focus. It was even more convincing. So he got his students to appreciate the mediation of uh, filmmaking through editing, through choice of a subject, through shot selection, and uh, was really looking at the greater truths. Uh, the, the power of Man of Aaron for him uh, was in its beauty. He called it uh, Flaherty, the first poet of American film. Uh, he, George had a real commitment to this film and to the Aran Islands. Uh, so the, the Man of Aran is uh, a dramatic film about the struggle of a family against the elements in a remote island off the, uh, off the coast of Ireland. And uh, uh, George, his grandfather, uh, emigrated to the US from the Aran Islands. George had a real investment in the islands. And before he started making this film in 1976, he went there for five summers and got to know people and embedded himself uh, in his history and in the culture of the islands. 
Uh, at NYU, he taught his students to ask the question, what will happen when the lights go up? And that's this, this uh, what we've talked about. So he, he brought his understanding of this relationship with the audience into his study of the Man of Aaron. Uh, so how the myth was made demonstrates uh, the value of many of Flaherty's uh, techniques and methods while it exposes the myth making of the film and, uh, and explores, uh, examines its consequences on the community, on the people who are in it. Uh, let's take a look at the opening. George narrates the film and appears in several scenes. He really shows his respect for working with the Islanders. The cliffs and skies and faces one sees on the Aran Islands these days haven't changed very much since Robert Flaherty came here back in 1931 to make his world-renowned motion picture, Man of Aran. Flaherty, America's most famous documentary filmmaker, had been attracted to these tiny islands off Ireland's west coast by stories he'd been told about the hard life of the people. People whose very faces had been chiseled by the storms that lashed their rocky shores. Today, the film Robert Flaherty made here has itself become legend. A glorious celebration of man's heroic struggle against the forces of nature. The film is also a legend the children and grandchildren of Flaherty's one-time film stars have lived with for more than four decades. Tell me, uh, Mr. Stoney, what's, uh, was your father and was he born here? My father was born here. Right, that's right. right. That's so. right. He was Could... born in, uh, in uh, Kilrona. Kilrona, yeah. yeah. Though my family left Aaron long before Flaherty arrived, I've been as captivated by his myth as any islander. Could you tell me what people on the island think of the film? There were lots of things that never happened really here at all. But in other words, it didn't represent the life of the people at all here, do you see? I don't know, lots of them didn't like it all. Of course, Flaherty, of course, made a good bit on that because he had very cheap labor here then. No, 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 no. Well, there lots of the old crowd didn't like that at all. Yeah. It is not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it made very little of them, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, even the poorest, they have their pride, as you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. patient, sympathetic listener. Uh, so Man of Aaron leaves a lot out. Uh, for example, it doesn't represent any class distinctions. It doesn't show the rich landlords and the landless people working as sharecroppers. In one scene in the film, uh, George recreates a famous pan that takes us across the barren landscape and ends at the uh, uh, fisherman's traditional cottage. Uh, and then in George's film, the pan continues and takes us to a landlord's estate. Uh, where the tenant farmers worked. Uh, it didn't fit Flaherty's story, but that's uh, the, uh, uh, the analysis of the myth that he's making. He portrays all kinds of misrepresentations. Uh, for example, the film shows shark hunting that had been not in practice for 50 years. Uh, Flaherty used smaller boats in the film so that it would look uh, 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 more fragile against the waves. Uh, he shot it with a telephoto lens that compressed actually two sets of waves and made uh, the whole fishing uh, expedition look much more dangerous than it was. Uh, so this was a kind of movie making and myth making and uh, uh, George puts together a group viewing uh, as we've seen has become central to his uh, to his film philosophy uh, to respond uh, to uh, a screening of A Man of Aaron on uh, Irish television. We'll see that in this scene. It astonishes me how it has lasted. 
most islanders are familiar with Flaherty's film. When Irish television broadcast it once again, a group of my friends gathered in the village school to refresh their memory. <laughs> I don't believe it's, it was real at all. As a matter of fact, it was not real, you see. The, it was staged, you see, because um, uh, the, I don't believe they would go out in such, uh, such a, uh, weather, uh, that could have seen especially. And it's another thing, you, we, I don't believe we ever had women working manual labor, carrying seaweed like that, you see. Yes, but Corley, this goes back, I suppose, a hundred... The Islanders have been arguing about Flaherty's film ever since he left. Some are proud of the hard struggle he dramatized. Others resent being associated with such poverty. I think Flaherty was emphasizing the hard life women had, you see. And I think to emphasize this, you have to exaggerate. And I think even today, it brings out the anxiety of any woman any wife whose husband is dealing with the scene. Flaherty cast a nuclear family uh, with unrelated islanders playing uh, the husband, wife, and their boy as archetypes. Uh, in these next scenes, George puts Harry Watt, uh, who was an apprentice uh, for Flaherty on Man of Aaron, uh, together with Maggie Duran, who played the mother. Uh, Harry Watt became a famous documentary filmmaker, made the great film Night Mail, and uh, George is staging this. He's bringing them together and creating these scenes uh, by uh, having Harry Watt drive them. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Harry Watt gets uh, Maggie to recreate one of the scenes uh, that she performed in the original movie. So here, this one, these two scenes. Shallow currents still take men to sea. And when the wind rises, though I may be safe ashore, I am transported back in memory to a small college movie house in North Carolina, where Flaherty's Man of Aaron first filled me with awe and wonder. Flaherty's cast of characters were all islanders, born and bred. As a documentary filmmaker myself, I'm always curious and sometimes concerned about what happens to people whose everyday lives are transformed when they become part of a film. Tiger King was the island's blacksmith. Michaeline was a schoolboy of 12. And Maggie Duran, already a mother of four, knew only the hard life of a farmer's wife before Flaherty saw and photographed her at this same cottage door. We asked Harry Watt, who apprenticed with Flaherty and later directed some of Britain's most powerful wartime documentaries, to come back to Aaron with us. Maggie Midia. Oh, sure. Beautiful as you ever. Very, very, <laughs> very, 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 very well confessed. You remember me, my I do God. very well. We've I not, do that we've we've not done indeed. badly, have we? Not, not at all, sir, not at all. It's a long time. It's a long time now. At the window, how about you did? Well, no, I did. For Maggie Duran, the legacy of Flaherty goes beyond financial measure. Oh, Mr. Jerry, now I right. come up in Africa, Hulk, nor war, and the thing. All right, Hulk, I'm not getting as much credit as the mission. I guess my heart is in Boston, so I'm not getting as much credit as the mission. Oh, 
What a marvelous scene. It's reenacting a reenactment uh, 40 years later with Maggie now being herself. Uh, so how the myth was made is both an exposé and an appreciation of Flaherty's film. Let's look at the end. Like other filmmakers who have studied the works of Robert Flaherty, my perception of what beauty is what courage can encompass has been profoundly altered. Perhaps the man we call the father of the documentary should be thought of, rather, as our first American film poet. Our first, and even today, I would say, our best. Would you please come out with me for a while, Julio? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. thank you. <coughs> The Aran Islanders, whom both Robert Flaherty and my father knew, have changed. But good things endure. The fun and friendship. The will to make the best of whatever life sends their way. I hope to come back often. Love that last scene of George dancing with Maggie and the final line of the film, I hope to come back often. Uh, that is the great difference between George and Flaherty. George wants to return and owns the consequences of his work. Uh, we've seen that at Challenge for Change, George took the appreciation of the role of the subjects in making a film to a new level. At the time, he said, filmmakers are used to playing God, and now we are saying to them, let the people tell you what they want to film, listen to them, the film is going to be their film. At a recent screening at American University, George told the students to ask about the people in their films, why are they in the film in the first place? What's in it for them? Can you persuade them that what you want is also what they want? So How the Myth Was Made was 1978, a film that George made with two former students of his, Jim Brown and Paul Barnes. Paul Barnes now works for Ken Burns, and Jim Brown uh, has been teaching at NYU for 15 years or so, uh, and is uh, doing very well in uh, music documentaries in his own right. He recently uh, finished his film on Pete Seeger called The Power of Song. Uh, very, very good film on Pete. He's been working on for a while. Um, so the films just before How the Myth Was Made uh, that George worked on with Jim and, and Paul, they did about four or five films before Myth. These were really his first independent films. I mean, after he had done, you know, two decades of work through the 50s and 60s with sponsored films and, and then gone off to Canada and come back and started teaching, he... His teaching career, I think, allowed him the freedom to not have to worry so much about making money off of these films, that he could get grant money uh, and pay for the film, certainly, but you know, didn't, didn't worry about his own paycheck because now it was coming from NYU. And he really enjoyed the balance of, of teaching and working and even crossed that line very often with Paul Barnes and, and Jim Brown. They were former students. Uh, his own son, uh, Jamie Stoney, began working with him after he was a student at NYU in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, Judith Helfand was also a student of George's uh, who co-produced and co-directed The Uprising <laughs> of 34 in 1995. That's the next film we're going to take a look at um, in the late 80s, uh, Vera Roney 
really spearheaded this idea to start to look at uh, this lost history of the general textile strike of 1934. And uh, she gathered academics, uh, historians, uh, people that she was interviewing and starting to get facts together about what that, what that strike was all about, and then called in George uh, with Jamie Stoney doing camera work to start filming. And when George and Jamie started filming with these mill town workers all over the South, and they, I, I don't know how many mills, mill towns they went to, how many different cities in the South they went to, but all over the South, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, um, Georgia, um, Alabama possibly. Yeah, so you have to remember that there were 500,000 uh, workers went on strike. It was uh, unprecedented, right. the largest strike. It was all over the South. And uh, though uh, George concentrated on South Carolina, the Carolinas, uh, it uh, really uh, was a much bigger story. Right. And it's interesting when they, when George and Jamie began this, uh, he came back to Vera Roney uh, and said, Vera, I just don't think there's a film here. People don't want to talk about this. And Vera said back to him, well, that's exactly why we have to make that film. And so they continued on and they pressed and they got these great stories of not only the strike itself, but histories of these mill towns and what it was like to, to live in these mill towns. Um, they ended up having a rough cut screening as, as George is wont to do. I've had a lot of experience with this that uh, way before the editor thinks the film is finished, George wants to get it out there and start showing it to people and get their reactions to see if he's going on the right track. And uh, at an early rough cut screening, uh, it was brought to his attention that there are no African Americans interviewed. And you know what was, what was their story in the mill towns? And George being George took that to heart. Uh, by that point, Judith Helfand had joined the production. Um, and Judith and George went back and found several African Americans uh, and interviewed them about their life in the mill town. Um, yeah, in fact, they were, it was really, uh, the subject was the uh, women who were working as servants in the mill town for the very poor mill workers. And so it really showed the layers of class distinction and uh, opportunities for work. I think the, the point you're bringing out of the uh, way they stimulated and promoted uh, uh, feedback is very interesting. So George had always uh, worked with the media when he started working in a film, All My Babies. He made contacts all over the town. He created uh, a real context for the film in the community. And with uh, uh, the uprising of 34, uh, <coughs> Uh, Judith and George met with the Charlotte Observer in 1990 and got them to write a story about the making of the film, the intention to make it, uh, with an 800 number inviting people to uh, volunteer their memories, uh, their memorabilia, uh, what they had, and they got a, a, an enormous response. Uh, they put together, well, remember this, the Vera Roney uh, put together a consortium of uh, academics who were studying uh, the history of the period, union leaders, community leaders. Uh, it was a very broad coalition. Uh, so it started with that base. Uh, they uh, were able to collect a tremendous amount of material and they went uh, to 80 homes uh, with the material and showed it to people and that's what really made things work. They got this Fox movie tone uh, footage of the uh, strike and used outtakes to uh, uh, get people to think and talk about it and showed it to them on their own television sets in their living rooms. Uh, here's what uh, Judith Helfand uh, wrote, uh, bringing the physical evidence of uni unionism to the town where it had been forged and then forgotten. The trunk of our car was weighed down with proof letters of mill workers to the Roosevelt administration demanding that their rights as workers and citizens be protected, a file full of the only comprehensive collection of photos of the strike, 
For many strike veterans, this was the first time they had seen these pictures and letters. That really uh, showed you the way they created uh, the, uh, uh, this film and how they engaged people and involved them. So George had started using feedback with his subjects early on. In, in uh, All My Babies, he rented a movie theater in the morning and showed the uh, uh, footage to uh, the cast and, and uh, the characters uh, and got their feedback and made changes based on that. Uh, and, and he did this all through the film. So um, I think I just quickly introduce the clips. And sure. So there's uh, mainly two quick clips we're going to uh, show you, which will hopefully tease you to stick around for the entire film. Um, uh, the first couple are, are the beginning of the film and uh, illustrate what we've been talking about, uh, but can't push it uh, enough that you know this this strike was not. You know, it was not entered into history. It was written out of history. You know, not only, you know, history books, but but the collective consciousness of the town. You had to go back to the, that generation and talk to them because that generation did not talk to their sons and daughters or grandsons and daughters about this horrible tragedy um, that was the uh, general textile strike of 1934. And then the the second half of the clips is. Um, as I say, the, uh, the African-American um, experience in these mill towns. It was on Labor Day in 1934 that I witnessed the closest thing that this country has had to a revolution. The general textile strike was one of the largest strikes in American history. It was the culmination of years of homegrown organizing and protest. For many Southern workers, it was the first time they had raised their voices as citizens to challenge the control of the mill owners. I never remember the strike being brought up in school. It was like, um, it was not to be mentioned. It was just like everybody was trying to keep everything quiet. Maybe it was just the, you know, just trying to get away from the sadness, what they had gone through. Never mentioned. Never mentioned. After that happened down there, Union was never mentioned again. Told her, no, they killed him. They were afraid, and they still are afraid. But we never had that on Sunday outside of church. About the only entertainment we had was to take pictures, maybe go up to the cemetery or out in the mill yard and take pictures with a Kodak. That's a, a black lady, Aunt Eliza. She washed for my grandmother when my grandmother's children were small. And then when my mother grew up, she would come over and wash for us. In the early 30s, there weren't any black women in the mill at that time. They did not hire black women in the mill. And we worked for the people that worked in the mill, the, the mill villages. And we took care of their house, took care of the children, and did their work while they worked mm -hmm. in the mill. That's what, that was our occupation at that time. They didn't have to pay them very much. They just practically raised the children. You could take your black hands and you could stir it in their dough or in their foods. And uh, you could take your black body and lay in the bed with the child and, and protecting it. But you couldn't come in their front door, right? You weren't worthy to come in, your, in their front door. We had uh, black domestic help, poor as we were. Uh, of course, the blacks being on the bottom of the social ladder at that time, there was no place they could work except, they couldn't work in the mill, by the way. Um, they couldn't come past a bail breaker, I don't believe. I went to work at, when I was 13 years old at the Modena Cotton Mill. That was around about 
1926, somewhere along in there, I think, right about that time. I uh, worked in the warehouse. We never did get to run no machine, though. <laughs> no way, we didn't get to run no machine. Were there any black spinners or weavers or loom fixers back then? No. I did not want nothing to me ever I would. Did you ever wonder why there wasn't? I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wonder why. Yeah. Uh, well, do you wonder why? I I have a pretty good idea. Well, why? They wanted to save the jobs for the white man. All right. <laughs> That's what I think. I just let you say it first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm afraid that was what it was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, a few years after uh, they finished that film, uh, Judith went back and shot with one town, uh, Hanea Path in South Carolina, that was erecting a little memorial uh, to those killed during the strike. And um, not only did she cover people coming to the memorial, expressing uh, some memories of family members, uh, but also uh, got in touch with the son of a mill owner, um, or he, I think he would have been grandson, Frank Beecham. Um, and uh, he's in the next clip we're going to see. This is all from a, a DVD extra that's included on the Uprising of 34 DVD called Hanea Path Remembers. I got a midnight phone call from a friend, a writer, who had seen an early screening uh, of uh, Uprising in Atlanta. And the, um, the gist of uh, the conversation was, do you have a grandfather named Dan Beecham? And I said, yeah. And he said, I think you need to see this film. Dan Beecham, the superintendent of Chicola Mill, was also mayor of Honeypie. He had everything tied up to where no one could do anything unless a union came in. And he would kill these people before he would let that happen. He placed these men in the windows of the mill. They were firing on their neighbors, the people they had grown up with, had worked with. But when they started shooting, people just started running. It was like being hit with a concrete block in the face. I only knew a couple of names, and that was from the film. That was Kathy Lamb and Sue Cannon Hill. And I was going to South Carolina, and I, um, I decided that I wanted to meet them. Now, I, I did a really stupid thing. Notice the word Beecham on here, how big it is. <laughs> now, if you got a letter in the mail, and the only way you knew that name was that that was the guy that had murdered one of your relatives, your you, you, you would not be happy about this. And Kathy Lamb wouldn't open her letter for days. She let it sit there thinking that I must be threatening her or something. Dear Miss Hill, I recently saw the film, The Uprising of 34, and was shocked at what I learned. As the grandson of Dan Beecham, the superintendent of the mill, and the mayor of Honeypath at the time of the shootings, I can only express deep sorrow for his actions. I support the monument being planned in Honeypath and plan to attend the dedication next Memorial Day. I send this letter, and I get a call that she will meet me. Now, I uh, took a tape recorder, like I do everywhere, and I'd like to play a, a two-minute segment of that meeting with Sue Hill. He bled on the sidewalk approximately, oh, I would say two feet. It run down. Stream of blood. Uh-huh. And every time it would rain, the spot would come back a dark, uh, copper-looking color, just where his blood had run. You said what your happened? mother would never walk on that sidewalk? Never. She would never go anywhere that she had to go up by where the meal was that Daddy got killed. It was really hard. 
but she never got over my father. Never. My grandfather organized the men, deputized the men that did the shooting. And I knew that he had, um, you know, been involved in it, but not to the degree that, uh, that he had been uh, until I saw the film. The primary reason we're here today is to honor those seven people who gave their lives to make things better for the rest of us. We're also here to honor those of you who are their family members, because we recognize that you had to grow up without husbands and uncles, brothers, daddies and granddaddies. I really appreciate Kathy and Robert. They've worked so hard on this. Isn't it beautiful? It feels really nice to have this memorial to my grandfather. I wish my grandma was here to see it. So that dedication to the monument uh, happened just a week before uh, the national broadcast. And you could see there was a lot of national media there to cover it as an event, it's another element of the uh, distribution and promotion strategy. Uh, also, the South Carolina Public Broadcasting did not show the film uh, when it was shown nationally because of mill owner interests uh, on the board of directors. So, so that film was completed in, in 1995. Um, and I just want to give a little small history of, of my time with George. Uh, I was a student at NYU from uh, 92 to 96. Uh, so during the, the, the post-production of this film, and uh, took George's documentary traditions class there, uh, which is a class I now am lucky enough to teach. And I had no intention of getting into documentary. I was focusing on cinematography with the full intention of doing feature films, working up that ladder, whatever that was going to be, but making narratives. And I took this class that I'm now teaching, uh, taught by George, and it changed everything right then and there just two semesters of watching films that inspired George, watching films by George, talking to filmmakers that George respected, and uh, it changed everything. And it was through, I won't get into the details about it, but uh, it was through some uh, office hour uh, meetings that George and I had that we got to know each other very well. And um, he pushed me to take his production course the next uh, semester the next year, which is my final year at school, which I did. And uh, he was impressed by some of the footage I was shooting for some of the other people in the class and hired me then and there to work on films with him. And from then on, we were in production on two or three films at a time until this past summer when he died. And I've still got three films I've got to finish up for him. Um, so one of those films uh, is, was a film called Getting Out, which we finished in, in 2005. This was a result of um, a, a film that uh, a volunteer organization up at Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York. You've all heard of Sing Sing. That's what, where going up the river comes from. Uh, you go up the river to Sing Sing. Maximum security prison. And uh, these volunteers were organizing a theater workshop group there uh, inside where the men would write their own plays, direct their own plays, and put them on for the rest of the prison population. And we followed the whole beginnings of that uh, uh, th through a few productions and the beginnings of the organization and, and everything, um, and found that the productions that we were filming, uh, which we gave copies of uh, to the volunteer organization, were being then sent out to the families of the prisoners who were inside, which was a wonderful experience for them. Um, George was very proud of this, and, and that's the reason why we kept going up there year after year. They would do two productions a year since 1996, um, and they're still doing two productions a year even now. 
which would run for you know four or five uh, nights. And through going up there again and again and again, uh, George kind of turned to me, and I think I kind of turned to him at the same time and said, you know, I think there's a larger film here. Let's let's pursue that. And we agreed to do so. And getting out is the result. Um, this is just a short clip. Uh, of um, Robert Sanchez, um, who was uh, uh, an actor in the very first play, a poet in the very first play. And um, this clip is split between the very first production, which we filmed inside of Sing Sing in 1997, I guess it would have been, and then uh, uh, intercut with uh, an interview with him when he got out uh, many years later. So I remember getting on the stage for the first time and I was like, oh God, I closed my eyes. I said, well, here it goes. And I came out and I got into character and I said, gentlemen, and everything was quiet. It was like the most quiet and I said, I got them. And that's when I said, you know, like I went on from there and I knew they were listening. So I just looked at the lights and I just didn't see anybody and I recited my poem. I begin to say with soothing manners. Gentlemen, I begin to say with soothing manners, not you today. I offer you the good life with the drop of strife. Diamonds, pearls, girls, the best of all worlds. A dream is just a dream if you can't chase it down. I am the dream merchant. Close your eyes and see what I sell. Remember, remember your struggles. All the little problems you just can't juggle from the rent not being paid to you not getting laid. You need the cash, the green, the pure cheddar. Accept my offer? You better. Don't worry, the dough you stack it. Money made from this little packet. Manteca, P-Funk, the junk better than the skunk, the cane, the strands of membranes through the veins. Insane, insane, I tell you, I sell you a dream in vain. It comes with the sweet seductress, dressed to impress in that hip-hugging red dress. She has the bedroom eyes, the luscious lips, and the long, luxurious hair. Her body whispers, make love to me if you dare, if you dare. So if this dream is your goal, you pay with your soul. And when I finished the poem and I turned around and I heard the cheer, I broke into tears. And I could never, I never, I will never forget that feeling. It was probably a spurt of growth in that moment. I grew, I grew 30 feet high. And um, I would always, October 8th, 1997. I will always remember that day and forever that day. It was a, it was a rebirth. So I always remember uh, when I was editing that film, um, you know, as George and I, uh, grew in our collaboration. It got to the point where I was, uh, I was editing, uh, and he would come in and, and just watch the next edit that I would do. And, and he told me that this is the way that he worked with uh, Sylvia Betts, who was his longtime editor in the 50s, that uh, she would take the footage from him and say, all right, George, now disappear for four or five weeks and come back, and I'll show you something. And that's how he asked me to do it, and I remember finishing uh, a second rough cut on this and, and showing it to George at my place in Brooklyn and him turning to me when it was over and, and he said, David, it's, it's a wonderful job. You've done what, what the prison, ha you've, you've given these men what the prison has taken away from them. You've given back their power. And that, that's really stuck with me. And that's, that says a lot about George. That, that's what he was always about, was, was giving the power back to those who may have lost it. Um, we're running out of time. Do we have time for reunion? I, I think we do, yes. because we're not yeah. back enough. 
Okay. So um, one of the one of the last three uh, works in progress uh, that that George has now left me with is a film called A Reunion of All My Babies, and, and this kind of takes our talk a, a full circle a bit. In 2002, uh, the original All My Babies was named to the uh, National Registry of Films to be preserved by the Library of Congress. And through that publicity, um, came to the attention of Bernard Coley, who was the grandson of Miss Mary Frances Hill Coley, and he'd never seen the film before. And he asked around on his side of the family if they'd ever seen before, and some of them had, and some of them hadn't, and some of them had good things to say about it, and some of them had interesting mythologies uh, in their head about some white northern filmmaker who came down, took advantage of their grandmother or mother, and, and ran off making lots of money on this film, which he certainly did. He had that second mortgage to pay off. Um, so this prompted uh, George to meet up with Bernard Coley and, and do an interview with him, and uh, gave us the idea that, that we wanted to, as George does in many of his films, return to the original film, keep in touch with these people, find out what's going on with them now, and um, really tell the story of midwifery at that time, of uh, the wonderful personality that uh, Miss Mary Coley uh, was, and um, talk a little bit about uh, what film production was like at that time. So this is... Um, Again, this is a work in progress, so what I'm going to show you now is just part of a, a six-minute sample reel um, that, that we've just put together for, for publicity. So let's take a look at it. I want you to meet Mrs. Mary Cooley, a midwife who lives in Albany, Georgia. This is a story of how she helps people all these your babies, Miss Mary? Yes, these are all my babies. Delivered about 1,400. Mrs. Mary Coley delivered my daughter. Miss Mary Coley delivered three of my children. Miss Mary Coley delivered all six of my children. Miss Mary Coley delivered me. Miss Mary delivered uh, our baby daughter. Two of my children were delivered by. Ms. Mary Frances Coley. And I was delivered by Ms. Mary Frances Coley. Ms. Mary Coley delivered three of my kids. Ms. Mary Frances Hill Coley delivered all 12 of my children. If I stumble on my way, don't it ain't really let me stay. I am willing to run all the I'm George Stoney, and I'm sitting on the steps of 807 Cotton Avenue in Albany, Georgia. By the time I made All My Babies here in 1952, I'd made a number of films with non-actors, and I knew that I had to trust the people in front of the camera to correct any misconceptions I might have. She is the only midwife I ever saw do a delivery. I'd seen deliveries at hospitals but I had not seen midwives do deliveries. And uh, so I was just in awe of her. I recognized that what she did in the home illustrated all the 118 points that I was given by the nurses and doctors who were advising me. Oh, look at them pretty new shoes. Look like Tom done bought somebody a present. All those little cliches uh, that should represent real humanity. It was like she was a part of the family. She was there so regular. She would come in the morning time and bathe that baby. Dress your baby. And give me a bath. And you lay down in that bed and you stay there. We had a wood stove. She'd go in there and make that fire and uh, fish my breakfast. She was my neighbor. She was our friend. She was just really a very fine lady. I've spent most of my career as a filmmaker making films that are supposed to have some kind of influence. They've been propaganda films or training films or something of the sort. And always 
I, almost always I've had two agendas. I've had the sponsor's purpose and I've had a, a kind of social purpose of my own. And it's very gratifying to find that so many people here uh, have seen the film early on, particularly the health workers, and have learned from it. It was so true to what we saw, but it's so much of what people have forgotten, of the care at home, the personality. You let it, nature take its course. We knew all this before, and now we're making a full 360-degree turn to come back to the understanding that, that birth is a natural process, and people are more comfortable the, in the more natural settings, and the more natural processes, what midwives have always known. I used to have to go and get her when it was time for my mom to have the baby. But I always saw her with that little black bag. <laughs> I never knew what was in that black bag. She would bring her little bag, and then they'd go in the room, and they'd put us outside. <laughs> <laughs> We children knew who she was. We thought them babies was in that bag she had. Because <laughs> they told us you get the babies out the woods. So all of us thought that that baby was in that bag she carried. <laughs> but then I found out different. <laughs> no, I didn't know nothing when I first come to see you. Yes, baby. honey, but you know the plenty now. Come on over, let's look at your baby things. <laughs> We hope to finish it uh, in the spring. Okay, if anybody has a, a comment or a question that they'd like to provide, uh, just uh, raise your hand. A little hard for me to see, the gentleman back there. My name is Eric Agnero, I'm a journalist. I also uh, tried uh, some movies to change people's mindset. I used to work for the Voice of America, so I agree with you. You know, democracy can be, you know, <laughs> influenced through the media until, you know, one day, you know, they start asking you to, to tell the world that Milosevic is not a good guy so that people can go invade his country. So then I went back to the Ivory Coast where I tried to, you know, to use my, uh, my skills in teaching people how to bear a farm, I had some contracts with uh, non-profits over there to help the farmers and to help some communities better the work. But then again, you know, uh, these big non-profits, you know, wouldn't want to put money into uh, uh, having the, the farmers themselves be the, the, the actors of these documentaries and propaganda movies. So this, uh, uh, this tribute to George is very, very inspiring me and comforting me that, you know, um, uh, it's, y you know, you can't bring the propaganda from up to, to down. It has to be also, you know, a, a dialogue. So here I am, very, very happy to have decided to resettle back in the U.S. in Vermont. Maybe I was aimed to meet uh, that great man and then God bless his soul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. I agree. We all agree. <laughs> Good luck to you. Uh, does anyone else have a comment or a question? You're right behind you, uh, Ross. Right behind you, literally. <laughs> yeah, I um, had the chance to uh, study the Challenge for Change stuff in the late 70s and ran a program in Boston, modeled on it for a while. One of the things that George said when looking back at the Challenge for Change stuff uh, that I've yet to see really people discuss other than here, uh, and I, I wonder about in access. There is a process of making the material in media, in media where you saw it with the community groups saying, well, is that the right question? Yes, keep the question in, not keep the question in. That actually activates the community more than the actual watching of uh, 
the material and that community access has become so much more oftentimes about the watching of it or about the putting it out there rather than about the engagement in the community of it. Um, and I know George was all about making the engagement in the community uh, to some degree. And I was wondering if the uh, panel had anything to say about that particular controversy. Uh, I'm sure Lauren Glenn might have something to say. <laughs> or <laughs> surely you must well yeah I guess I do but um, could you just restate what the controversy yes. is the controversy has been for a long time that somehow the playing of the documentary okay the, uh, the creation of the documentary was a way of changing people's minds that put that putting it out there and you know and that like I said oh and if we can get it on broadcast it'll even be more important than uh, you know getting it on the uh, the cable whereas my discovery was you know and I and I played that one through a number of times was that it was actually more important to actually have been making the uh, media with the community than it was to actually have uh, it broadcast in any uh, recognizable way because the choices that people make within the creation of it were much more important for creating community and for making change than the actual playing it back, which, which begins to turn the whole idea of the media on its head in some degree. And, I'm, uh, and I, I know that's controversial for a lot of people, but I... Well, I think you, your experience with access, you put your nail on the head, really, of, of you know, people always have said to us, well, how many people are watching? As if that is the, the measure of the value of the work that we do. And, you know, um, Megan O'Rourke is here in the audience, and she's our trainer at Channel 17, and many people here from Access. And, you know, we know that the, 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 the essence of the work is listening to the story that people want to tell and asking them questions about what is the most effective way to get that story produced, but even more importantly, who's going to watch it, and in what setting, and what's the desired goal, right? So it really isn't about lots of people watching. That's one measure. It's what difference did it make that you got up and made that program, and what, what change are you trying to elicit? I think there's something more here, which is that the process itself is a form of community building. Right and that uh, in making the collective decisions about what should be in the film, uh, what, what the stories are that make sense, uh, it's, it's a, a very powerful process that uh, uh, really challenges the uh, dominant media-making mode, which is individual. Our films are made by individuals about individuals, whether that's a hero, a victim, or a perpetrator. But George made films with communities, about communities, and the very process of making those films builds community. Um, ditto to, is it your name, Eric? Yeah, Eric, yeah. Very inspiring. Um, I was also, did some journalism. I'm an acupuncturist. I made a movie about ear acupuncture. I did it through the, uh, the, uh, the Access channel in White River. If they hadn't been there, I wouldn't be here today, okay? <laughs> It ran on access. I don't know who saw it. I don't care. Now <laughs> Yale is teaching what I have put out there because of, because of Access Channel. So that is a very sideline. I just had to put that plug in for Thank you. Access because <laughs> otherwise I would have been dead in the water. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to shoot or do anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, the, 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 and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. The woman in the center, uh, Ross, the, uh, it's here. It's here. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Uh, my name's Ross Payne, and it's I was Ross. in a documentary film group called Newsreel, and we made many, many, many documentary films, and you're, I never really knew much about George at all. In fact, I didn't know, I thought I, I was going to see him here tonight talking, <laughs> to tell you the truth, and it brought tears to me, especially the scene about the union organizing woman, because my mother spent time in jail as being a union organizer, and our, f I mean, I think that what, I mean, this has to be out there more. I mean, the, his history and stuff. And maybe it is, but um, I can't believe that I, I mean, I knew the name, but I didn't know what, this is the first time I ever saw anything he did. And I think it was really strong just having this footage and 
hopefully it's going to get out, or it is going out all over the, the country and the world to see the, the documentation that he did. Um, and I don't, I don't really have much more to say, except that it was just very moving to me to see this. And I feel like such an idiot <laughs> that being in Newsreel, one of the founders of Newsreel, there's another person here who was at the first meeting also, and maybe she knew more about it than I did, but I just feel like I was just in Dada land somewhere or something. So Don't. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, that isn't, uh, down here, uh, Sam has a, has a comment uh, in the front. Um, yeah, I mean, we in the panel were talking earlier, and uh, we had kind of a similar reaction. I mean, we, uh, maybe not David so much as, as uh, Lauren Glenn and, and me, but, you know, we've known George for many, many years, and we're in doing this and putting this program together, we're learning things. Uh, some of the myths for us were shattered too about George, and a lot of things that we didn't know were also added to our to our uh, knowledge. And now we're more in awe, right, Sam? Um, one of the things that I love about George Stoney's work is the idea of um, people coming together at the, you know, people coming together and watching it, and then after the viewing experience, people talk about the thing that is the you know is the point of the movie, and so community building continues even after the movie is watched. Mm -hmm. And certainly that was in the spirit of Newsreel. I distributed Newsreel films uh, in Los Angeles, LA Newsreel, and uh, we were waiting for video uh, to happen uh, as a kind of powerful tool for democracy, for penetrating everyday life, and for, for giving uh, uh, communities the ability to make their own media. But it did come out of uh, that 60s commitment to using film in small settings for the kinds of discussions you're talking about. I think that George set a really high bar because organizing people is very time consuming. And to produce a program is much easier in a way than organizing people to action. And so I think that that's one of the, the great lessons of George and, and the fact that he was willing to take the time that was necessary to build those relationships, that his films were actually social action in themselves, and then how he framed them as um, a community engagement process, as one part of a, of a longer community engagement process really points to him as a master community organizer, which really, in the access world, is the message that is so important to us, is that we really are first community organizers and second media makers. That's true. The woman right here. Um, can you say a few words about how available the films are and if any of them can be shown mm -hmm. in our stations? I think they'd be very mm -hmm. inspiring for people to pick up a camera and make that film on that to topic that matters to them. This is a perfect uh, way to uh, finish. Cynthia. We have experts right in the room. First, uh, Cynthia has a few words from yeah, about DER. Uh, uh, the company I ran for 20 years, Documentary Educational Resources, DER. They're out of Boston. Uh, we've been spending the past couple of years locating master materials for as many of Stony films as we can uh, locate with the help of, of David and um, uh, uh, another one, uh, an archivist who's been working with Stony. And uh, a, a number, quite a few of the films are available through der.org. Um, and we have them on DVD, and uh, they are being streamed, and so that, that would be a good source to be, at least to start. Uh, How the Myth Was Made is on the DVD of Man of Aaron. Exactly. Right. And uh, yeah. it's, it's uh, great. And also the Uprising, you can see, I hope you can stay and see it on the big screen where you should see it, but it's also online at pbs.org slash POV. And David, you probably also have versions in in the DER catalog as well. Um, you know, it's a, it's an extensive filmography, uh, and it spans a long period of time, um, and it's, it spans very different films. Uh, you know, sponsored films for big companies, small films for very very small, uh, uh, even personal films that were that were funded by by individuals so you know it's been a task for for Mike Hazard um, and myself and a few others to to try to find best copies of these um, but you know we are committed to getting them out there to to, to DVD uh, you know as soon as as soon as we can and there are I think 10 films with DER right now 
something like that. Yeah. And, and there are more to come in the contract. Uh, some of the films that George and I made together are going to be coming up soon. And, uh, you know, we're still finding more. You know, I mean, this is the what happens with uh, film and, and archives is you just you end up hearing from somebody five years after you last talked about it. Oh, yeah, I happen to have a copy of that film. Oh, great. You're the only one in the world who does. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, thank you so much. This is, I unfortunately have to end our open discussion, but uh, I want to uh, certainly thank, uh, Orly, did you have something to, to say before the? Uh, I would like to speak. Okay, okay, shall I turn it over to you at the end? Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I certainly want to thank all the panelists and, uh, and certainly Cynthia Close uh, from uh, Documentary Educational Resources, the National Film Board of Canada, the three Burlington Community Media Centers, and especially Orly Yadin, the executive director of this film festival uh, for one of the original ideas of doing this thing and making space and time available to hold this, to conduct and hold this tribute to George C. Stoney. And I think if somehow you didn't know about George, uh, like Roz, or wondered why he's so venerated, well, today's presentation and discussion, I, we hope that it's given you the background and the motivation to carry some of what you've learned today into how you view, make, or screen documentary films.